All right, good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of Penn Law Intellectual Property Group, I'd like to welcome all of you to our fourth annual symposium on copyright law. Um, as you can imagine, this year's topic comes at a very exciting time. On the one hand, the basic principles underlying copyright law remain the same. Copyright continues to protect the rights in original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And on the other hand, we've seen in recent years how evolving technologies and digital media have influenced the different ways that we create, consume, distribute, and build on creative content. And so this year's symposium aims to examine these many points of intersection with copyright law and the importance of this overlap to the legal as well as the creative community. Um, today, we have the great pleasure of hearing from many talented scholars, practitioners, and authors on a variety of exciting issues in this area. We will first hear from our remarkable and accomplished keynote speaker, the General Counsel and Senior Vice President, Kenneth Rocheri, who I will introduce in just one moment. Uh, following him, we'll have our first panel, uh, which will discuss the various issues surrounding content licensing and distribution on the web. Next will be our panel on open source software and derivative works. And then finally, we're going to wrap up the discussion uh, with our panel offering three or two unique perspectives on copyright and authorship. Um, before we begin, however, I want to give a special thanks to our symposium chair, Anil Makijani, for his help in putting together this symposium. Um, of course, though, Penn Intellectual Property Group could not have done it alone, and we really owe a great debt of gratitude to our sponsors at Kenyon & Kenyon, um, whose generosity really did help make today's event possible. Uh, our goal this year was to try and make the symposium as interactive as possible, leaving uh, 20 minutes for questions after each panel. So I really highly encourage all of you to ask any and all questions that you have of our talented lineup of panelists that we have today. But uh, at the close of the symposium, I also invite all of you to join us downstairs in the Great Hall. We're having a reception afterwards, so please come. And um, I'd now like to say a couple of remarks about to introduce our well-renowned keynote speaker, um, Kenneth Rocheri. And uh, it's our great pleasure to we welcome Mr. Rocheri, who comes to us from the New York Times Company. He was born in Jersey City, New Jersey, uh, and Mr. Rocheri went on to receive his undergraduate degree in political science from Brown University, and then his JD from Harvard Law School. After graduating at the top of his class, he worked as an associate at the leading law firm of Cahill Gordon. And Mr. Rashiri finally joined the New York Times as legal counsel in 1983. And since then, he's risen through the ranks to become the true mogul in the newspaper publishing business that he is today, having handled a range of matters on electronic publishing and copyright. Mr. Rashiri now serves as senior vice president and general counsel of the New York Times. And so, without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor on over to our keynote speaker, so please give him a warm welcome. Um, well, thank you, and uh, thank you, Neil, for, for inviting me today. Uh, just for the record, I, top of the class is a little bit of an exaggeration. Okay. I did okay, but I wouldn't go that far. Um, what I'm going to do today is really, really talk about you know what I what I know best, and to try to give you some insight into you know how I, as you know, a general counsel of a, of a news and information uh, company, you know view, view copyright in the context of a rapidly changing world where both the, the norms of copyright are changing as well as um, uh, the norms of news distribution, news and information distribution, um, uh, are changing. You know. The focus here is, is, I suppose, you know, is on copyright, and, and the question is whether, you know, copyright is as some think, uh, you know, sort of a kind of holy grail, a body of law that that the electronic, uh, the electronic world, put to the side, and if we could only strengthen it and bring it back to the middle, and and give it the respect it deserves, um, it would it would restore the economic uh, viability of of the publishing industry, um, and and you know that that is that is 
one widely held view. Um, as you'll hear, it's, it's really, not, really not my view. In my view, there are inherent limitations in copyright, um, you know, primarily as affect news and information that make it, that make it ill-suited um, to that task. My perspective is really, it's not, it's not academic and it's not, doc, not doctrinal. It's really a very practical perspective born from, from, you know, from where I sit, which is, as I said, at the helm of a, of a company with, with, with big but limited resources trying to navigate, trying to navigate uh, an ever-changing world. I think you've given me about a half an hour, and I'll try to speak less than that because I've heard through the grapevine a lot of people have questions, and I'm you know, happy to take any questions anybody has. Um, before I begin, I want to issue uh, you know, the standard disclaimer. You know, I am the general counsel of the New York Times Company, but my views expressed today and opinions today are mine, and they don't represent um, necessarily the views of, of my company. I just talk a little bit about, about my background. Everybody is shaped by their own background, and I ought to tell you a little bit about mine. I am not a typical IP lawyer. Okay? Most IP practitioners you know, develop their craft by representing licensees or licensors, either in a transactional environment or uh, in a litigation context. Their world and their worldview is a commercial one. Somebody has rights, and somebody wants to use those rights, and somebody's going to pay. Um, you know, by contrast, I came to copyright through the First Amendment. Okay? My, my early experience with copyright pretty much fell into one of two categories. I was either telling editors how to write a story that would fall into the boundaries of fair use, or I was dealing with copyright holders or their lawyers after a story, telling them why we weren't going to pay them any money because their, our, their work had appeared in a, in a news column. Um, now, some might see some irony uh, in that background, given how the news uh, and information world has evolved online. But actually, I think for me, it, that's been a good touchdown um, that's kept me grounded and actually served me well as I'm trying to figure out you know, what to do. Um, the fact of the matter is, free expression is a core value, and, and a robust, though by no means unlimited, um, concept of fair use uh, is appropriate and, and needs to be respected, even if it's, it's, your, it's your work that's being taken. You know, it goes both ways. Some commentators kind of view the position of news and information providers through the lens of the experience of the music and movie industries. Okay. While there are certainly some similarities, I find that analogy wanting and it's never, never really worked for me. The threat posed by digital media to mu uh, music and movies is largely technical. Uh, simply put, theft has become like preposterously easy. Okay? With, with a few clicks of a mouse, you can create duplicate originals. I wouldn't even call them copies. They're duplicate originals and distribute them around the world. Um, this presents you know, massive enforcement concerns, but the underlying activity is as illegal in the digital world as it was in the analog world. The behavior really didn't change and the law didn't change. News and information providers do suffer from straight out and out theft. That's absolutely true. But there's no single news article that has the inherent value of, say, a song or a movie such that the appearance, of, the appearance of that article on somebody else's website would do serious economic um, harm. So while we certainly go after thieves when we find them, and we do send out cease and desist um, notices by the dozens, it seems, sometimes, um, that's not really something I spend a lot of time worrying about, and I don't really think about it that much. What I do think about is my old friend, fair use. Um, copyright, as we all know, protects expression and not facts. You know, as creative works, things like novels, movies, songs, uh, receive the highest protection because they're 100% expression, okay? But the copyright for news has always been, you know, called thin. It has been a thin copyright. The exact expression used in a newspaper or magazine article is protected, but the underlying facts are not. They're not owned by the publication um, that, that brought them, that originally brought them to light. So as soon as that article comes out, others are free 
to trade on and use those facts. Now, that, that's long been the case. I mean, we can all remember um, countless times when you, know, you get up in the morning and you hear TV or radio announcers say, you know, the New York Times is reporting today that, and then, you know, goes on and, and reports on a story it took us sometimes weeks or months to, to unearth. Um, in the analog world, the economic consequences of that activity were limited. You know, publications could and, and actually would sort of view it as, you know, as, as branding, as inexpensive sort of branding. Um, and, and that's how you just, you rolled with it. The internet world, though, you know, has severely changed that economic equation in, in, a, very, in a very material sense. I trace, I, I trace the beginnings of that, really, to the rise of search, okay? If, if the internet had evolved as many predicted it would once upon a time with, with portals and content sites under them, it, 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 what it would have done, it would have sort of largely mirrored in the digital world the kind of a regime you have on cable TV. And that's sort of a manageable world for copyright holders. And, and I think the copyright issues would have sort of confined, been confined. Um, but that didn't happen. Search, you know, personified by that enormously successful company, Google, um, has become the main way, the principal way of, of navigating the web and organizing the web. Um, and in the process, among the other things it did, in the process, it, it made the article and not the publication the, the principal unit of distribution. And that's a very significant kind of economic and sort of legal development as well. Now, I don't, I don't need to explain you know, to this group, I think, how search works. I mean, web crawlers visit billions of pages. They place copies of those pages in a giant cache where they're indexed and ranked when a user types in a query. Uh, the results page displays the most relevant results. Um, for news articles, this generally means displaying the headline and the first sentence or so. I think the, don't quote me, but I think the Google result is 40 characters or 35 characters or something like that. Um, now, some publishers have argued that this display of the headline and the first sentence without permission amounts to copyright infringement. Um, and in the earlier years of search, there were actually several legal efforts made you know, to assert this principle in the courts. Um, in the U.S., they pretty much failed. I mean, generally speaking, the courts that addressed the issue ruled, A, search was transformative, so that the copying that took place in that context, in that context was a fair use. That the headlines and, and the text displayed in the results set were really there to describe the web page and not, not for their expressive value, and so that was a fair use. And Underlying that was, a, was something that many of the courts remarked on was that if the plaintiff really didn't want to be included in the Google search results, all it had to do uh, was indicate it by using the robots.txt protocol. Um, the most well, the most, <laughs> the most well financed uh, challenge to search uh, was brought by Agency France Press in 2005. Um, interestingly, that case did not proceed very far, it didn't go to trial and it was resolved in a confidential settlement. I'm, of course, uh, you know, not privy to anyone else's litigation strategy, but I've always thought that Google, frankly, was just playing for time with that settlement in the belief, you know, correct in my view, that time was on their side and that the longer search lasted and the more time it had to become sort of embedded in the way people behaved, the less likely that any challenge to search uh, on copyright grounds would succeed. Um, recently, some publishers, mostly smaller publishers, but, but a, a substantial minority, sort of resurrected the copyright issues with search, um, both in hearings before the FTC uh, and, in, and in public statements. I don't personally think much is gonna come of it. I think that the day, if it ever existed, this was a winning argument, um, is gone. Um, and even putting aside the, the enormous you know, time and expense that you would take to, to launch and maintain a, a campaign, against uh, the search, search companies to, to, to prove that point. Plus, you need to keep in mind that reason I said that the courts um, uh, often pointed to in, in, these, in these search cases. If you don't want to be included, you really don't have to sue. You just have to program your web pages. 
Very few publishers have taken that approach. I actually don't know of anybody who's taken that approach. And, and there's a reason for that. Uh, as difficult as your experience now is on the web, it would be a lot harder if you were invisible. And that's what would basically happen if you weren't in search. Um, now, a, as an aside, I should note that this issue is a very live one in Europe, okay? Um, in Europe, the, search against, the, the suits against search have fared better. There's a, a, a Belgian consortium of newspapers, and I believe a Dutch one as well, that have sued Google and, and have won. They've won damages and they've won the right to be out of search. Now, I, don't, I have to say, I don't fully understand how it's played out because after they've won those cases and yet it seems to me Google um, is doing business as usual in, in, in Europe just like they are here. And in fact, in some European countries, um, uh, Great Britain being one of them, that their, their dominance in search is actually greater than it is in the United States. So it hasn't, it hasn't really slowed them down. Um, but e even if we accept that the use of headlines and links in the context of search is permissible, does it necessarily follow that all uses of this content is permissible? And that, that really is the question posed by um, aggregation, or as my assistant wrote when she first typed this, aggravation, which is actually a better word for it from my perspective sometimes. Um, aggregation as a term is a, is a single word that unfortunately is used to cover a lot of ground, um, too much in my view. Many content sites, nytimes.com included, often link to third-party content uh, across the web, either in the context of an article on the same topic or in the context of a survey kind of piece. You know, here is what people who we find interesting are saying on this topic, okay? That's aggregation. But there are also sites that, as a standing practice, collect, present, and organize uh, dozens of headlines, summaries, and links in an effort essentially to become a news homepage and, and, in a sense, disaggregate your content from your consumer. That's aggregation, too. Okay. Um, there's an important economic and I, and, I think, legal distinction that could be made between the two. In the former, there's no attempt to substitute for the original content. And in the latter, there is, or at least I think there is. You know, as we all know, or as anybody who's, who's ever litigated a case, litigated a case knows, um, it's one thing to know something, it's quite another thing to be able to establish it uh, in court. Now, I should say that I was actually involved in one of the, uh, to my dismay, uh, one of the very few cases, uh, lawsuits involving aggregation. Uh, Boston.com, one of our sites, had decided to launch a series of town-specific subsites. Um, these mini sites were sort of designed to be reference points for all things in, you know, name of town. And the home page of these sites um, presented a lot of content that the globe itself created, presented a lot of public content, information about things happening, but also had a little box, and the box was something like um, news, from, news from other sources. And in that box, we put headlines, um, a little bit of the first section, a little bit of a sentence, and, and clean links out to third party content, but the news about the town. Um, most sites thought this was great. You know, Boston.com is one of the most heavily trafficked websites in New England, and they were getting a lot of traffic. Um, one site didn't, and we were soon found ourselves sued by Gatehouse Media. Um, Gatehouse is the publish, publisher of many local newspapers, um, and they sued us alleging copyright infringement for the inclusion of uh, headlines and links to their stories in this box. Um, now, although you know, you know, their main concern was a competitive concern. I mean, it's not, it's not an irrational concern. They, they also had local websites, locally oriented websites, and they were concerned that with the bulking up of our website, we would become the de facto destination site and subsume them. But they really didn't assert that claim. They asserted copyright, trademark, deceptive trade practices claims. But at heart, it's a copyright case. And they asserted that our taking of the headline and the first sentence, and we actually took less uh, than Google did for the exact same article because we had less space, um, violated the copyright. And that was even as they conceded that they didn't have really, um, didn't really have a, an issue with Google. From our side of the case, one of the animating features of the case, and it shouldn't really have been an animating feature, but we are human beings, and it was, was that up until the day before the lawsuit, they were linking to our stuff like mad. 
and you know, they, they took them down the day before they sued, but it is a long-standing practice to link to Globe articles to, to augment their, their sort of um, local sites. Um, in any event, when everybody calmed down, everybody realized that these tiny sites you know, could not justify the legal resources that were required to resolve the matter, and we settled the case. The settlement is public. It was posted on the web. And, and it's based on a principle that I've actually come to see as central, um, and that in my own mind I call it you know, the consent of the governed, in a sense. Um, and simply put, the settlement was this. We committed to Gatehouse that if they put up the robots TXT protocol to ban our crawlers, um, we would respect it and not circumvent it. I mean, one of the nutty things about the case was they thought we were illegally crawling their website and we were just taking their RSS feed, which they were broadcasting. Um, but they, they committed to, restrict, to respect a similar restriction on our part um, if we chose to impose it. Uh, in the settlement, we said we had no present intent to impose it, and I, we have not imposed it, and I wouldn't. I don't, I don't really sort of believe in that philosophy. Um, but if you turn back to, to NY Times, that sort of approach, that consent of the government, is actually what, what we use on our own website. Um, we have a few bots. If you don't want to be crawled, you just tell us, put it in the TXT, and, and we're done. And in our, um, in our sort of aggregation kind of um, blogs and articles, you know, what's going on around the web, if, if you don't want to be mentioned, you just tell us, and the editors won't pick you. You know, you'll just be out. You know, that won't, that doesn't hold. People don't get a veto on, on, on a straight news article. You know, if there's, a, if there's news breaking and we think your website uh, linking to your website is important for the coverage to our readers. We're going to link to you. And we'll, we'll bring that in. But but for other things, you know, you can you can you can take it out. Now now I took away from that litigation a number of lessons uh, for the uh, for the application of copyright on the web. But I'll note two of them. First, while the aggregation issue is often framed in copyright, because that actually appears to be the best legal hook, it's really not copyright harm in the sense of purloined or taken expression, that's at issue. You know? Again, going back to the Gatehouse case, the other side conceded that without their permission, we could rewrite the headline and summarize the news, and that with or without a link, it would be fine. They wouldn't have a cause of action. Okay? As a practical matter, whatever harm was being created by us doing what we did was either replicated or made worse. <laughs> By, by the alternate court of course of action being suggested. Um, second lesson I learned is that as a practical matter, fair use is actually a pretty crummy litigation tool. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it for a second, what would have happened if we litigated this case to the end? What would we, in the sense of both parties, have gotten out of this after we'd spent you know, small fortunes? We would have gotten a decision that was defined and bounded by the facts presented, or close to it, that might apply to other very closely similarly situated cases. But by the time we got the decision, it, it would be years later, and the web would have moved on and iterated several times. It would, it would have been a decision about the past. So it's not really a particularly good use of anybody's financial or legal time, in my view, in this, which is why you know, if you've, if you've noticed the Times, I had a discussion today with somebody earlier on, on rights saving. The Times has kind of stayed away from the, the, the fair use uh, claims, even when I think we have a good one. Um, one. One final aside on the copyrightability of headlines. People who think headlines are and ought to be uh, copyrightable usually cite, you know, probably the most famous headline ever written, which is the New York Post's, you know, headless body and topless bar. Um, now, if you're an alert reader, you may have picked up that, that these sorts of headlines are becoming rarer and rarer. And you'd be right, they are. And the reason is, while headlines like this are really attractive to human beings, search engines have no idea what to make of them. Okay? And so if you put a headline like that on your article, you will disappear in search. So the reason you are seeing more and more boring headlines is that the headlines are being written for machines and not for people. Now, so. 
right. Where am I here? Sorry, hold on. Some other apps. Well, no discussion of, of copyright issues facing publishers, you know, would, would be complete uh, without some mention of, of the so-called news apps. Um, uh, apps simply described are just single-purpose programs uh, designed to work with with a device. Uh, generally, uh, now that's an that's an Apple product, but but you're also seeing them increasingly done for, uh, on, on the Android platform as well. Um, but, but behind this simple description is a real sea change um, in the role of tools used to perceive the web. Okay? Traditionally, browsers were designed to be neutral in that, in that they were designed to view the web page as the publisher intended. Even though we all know there really is no page that exists anywhere, it's just code in a machine, the idea of the browser was to be as transparent and to present the organization that the publisher intended. Okay. Um, each publisher did have its idiosyncrasies, but directionally the neutrality statement is right. Apps in contrast, news apps in particular, are often designed to change that user experience, or more subtly, to allow the user to change his or her own experience so that, so that the person can interact with the website the way he or she wants. The changes can be relatively simple, font, something like that, to more complex organization or presentation, and can have some very serious economic um, consequences. It's so long ads, goodbye ads. Um, there's no easy or uniform answer here. Um, apps operate in all different ways. Uh, some of them operate by scraping and, content, and copying content from your website. And as to these, is a pretty straightforward you know, copyright, um, copyright response. But the ones that don't copy pages and that enable rather than require user behavior of the type described definitely present an issue for all publishers that, being honest about it, we and everybody else in the industry is just sort of still, um, still thinking through. And I think in some ways, you know, the challenges presented by apps uh, is an appropriate point on which sort of to sum up. In the digital world, publishers face an environment where their legal rights are often ambiguous and where in many cases their economic interests are as well. I mean, so ought you, as my clients would often say, should you go legal uh, on an app to force changes that in truth aren't really everything you need? Or do, you, or do you make the choice to work with the developer, try to carve a place for yourself in the app, in, in the app environment, even as you're worried that if that app takes off, you're gonna lose leverage and a lot of influence. There's no easy answer and there's no simple fix. Um, copyright definitely has a role to play um, and it's an important role. But as I think you've gathered from say, I don't view copyright um, that copyright alone um, can provide a path to success in the digital world. For news and information providers, it's an important piece, but just one piece of a, of a multi-dimensional um, puzzle that needs to be solved. Thank you. And, and I don't know the timing, but I'm happy to take any questions on anything now. They, they can bring up, I'm sorry. Yeah. One of their services is that if you click on um, a Google link and the page doesn't come up, they may have cached the page. Yeah. And maybe in the, in the same group of ideas, what about the fact that somewhere among all their computers, your entire daily publication is, is on those computers, maybe chopped up and, and things like that, but they've made copies so they can work with it. Do they need permission to keep such extensive copies of a, of a newspaper? And the second thing that they do that's kind of interesting is they can make a translation. And traditionally in copyrights, the translation rights have been important. Yeah. So I can press a button and I can turn your pages into Spanish or something like that. What about those rights? Yeah. 
Oh, no, that's, that's a really good question. Let me answer the first one first. Um, I think most courts would, would view the caching copies as incidental to the, to the search mechanism as part of the transformative function. I don't think people have gotten too much traction on that. The translation, I don't have a good answer on translation. That's a really good point. Translation rights are, are the copyright, uh, are rights that belong to the copyright holder. Um, that ought to be the same whether it's a human being translating it or whether it's this magic machine. Um, if I had more time today, I would have talked a little bit about how the mores of the web and people's behavior are, are leading changes in copyright and copyright thinking. I think that's true with photographs. I also think it's true uh, in this case. I think at the end of the day, again, the longer it goes on, the less likely that claim is to be recognized because it's such a valuable thing that everybody gets to use and incorporate. But technically, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely, it's absolutely right. Yeah? I can the strategy that the Associated Press I, I can't, I'm, uh, what, what you thought about the strategy that the AP has taken with the Shep Ferry Hope photo and I know you said you're not a fan of fair use claims yeah, but okay. why are they doing that and will it work? Well, it didn't work. I mean, at some level. I mean, they, they, she, Shepard Ferry, for, for those of you who don't know, um, he's, he's an artist. Um, he's kind of an out there street artist type person, I guess. Uh, the bad boy of, of his kind of art. Um, but he created the Obama Hope poster, okay? And um, sometime well after the election, and I'm not even sure exactly how, uh, somebody figures out that the model for the Hope poster was an AP photograph of Obama at a conference. Um, and AP sued him for copyright infringement. And this is, again, a cautionary lesson about litigation, okay? It's a fairly, in a sense, a straightforward case. It was, it was a little bit, facts were a little odd. They had a dispute over what photograph he actually used, um, and he lied, okay? And, and, and the importance of that was um, in the um, background of the photo that he used, there was an American flag, and that was in the poster. And what he wanted, what he, he was trying to say, okay, I didn't take that expression from the photograph. I just took what Obama looked like. Nobody has a copyright. The, the, the photographer has a copyright in the expression they add, but they don't have a, a copyright on what Obama looks like. That's really what the case was. Um, that case got settled recently. It's one of those kind of settlements that when you read it, you can't understand what happened. And what happened was basically everybody just picked up their tents and, and, and went home. Not a very successful strategy, I would say, actually. Not, not a successful strategy. Now, from AP's point, of, AP's point of view, you know, they felt um, that it was, you know, they, they viewed it as, as, as if the photo itself had been taken and it was, it was a theft of that. Um, I, I don't know, I, I do know the people at the AP, I don't know what they would think now in retrospect. But it's a cautionary tale about, you know, the, a, fair, a fair use fight is an equitable fight and it's a messy fight and I, I think word on the street is that uh, the case was settled after, you know, a route is into seven figures in legal fees and they hadn't gotten close to a trial. Yeah. There were any like copyright considerations that went into that decision? No. No, uh, the question, the question for those of you that was about, about the times that metered model on web, whether there are copyright considerations. No, no, not really, and I would say not at all. It is sort of interesting. I've never quite figured it out that, you know, if you're charging, some people, some people have come to say, well, now that you're charging, you know, you'll, you'll be more careful about protecting your copyright. Well, no. Uh, I mean, we, even though we weren't charging, we were monetizing the website. It was being monetized through advertising. Uh, I, I don't expect that. If the question is, uh, am I going to change the copyright protection regime because we're charging? I don't, I don't think so. I have no plans to do that, and that wasn't a big part of this. It's really an effort to get a, um, the website is an enormous website at this point, and to try to get a second revenue stream out of it. So, yeah. uh, I also want to applaud for the strategy. I mean, the day I look forward to the subscription model. I think it's a great move. Uh, my question was, did I catch you correctly in suggesting that in refusing to opt out, it's almost a consent 
in, in a way to use the material? Well, or? that's that, you mean in terms of in, in terms of yes, that that's. It, it, you're talking about now the, the, the robots TXT thing. It's a very interesting aspect. Absolutely, under traditional copyright, you don't have to do anything. It's not your job. Absolutely not your job. And yet, um, that was cited by a number of courts. That look, you know, all you had to do was X. It seems a minimal thing to do. I think that's just another example that of traditional copyright rules being applied differently on the web. But I mean. You know, I, one can't predict what, what other courts will do in the future, but, but that is cited by a number of courts. They just say, okay, what's this all about? You can, you can do that. Is that it? All right, well, thank you very much. It was fun to be here.